you guys know that God is love, right? 1 John 4, verse 12 says that if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. See, God is love. So if you love one another, it's because God abides in you. And his love is perfected in us. Where is his perfect love, right? Where is this love? Is it in your emotion realm? Is it in the physical realm? Does it have to do with physical love or emotional? See, this is really something to think about when you see a scripture like this, a verse like this. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13 though, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. By this we know, how's that? Because he has given us his spirit. See, God moved into you, into your house, your tent, your tabernacle, this place, right? He moved in in spirit. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says that the one that's joined to the Lord is one spirit, not one flesh, not one emotion, one spirit. Verse 15 how do you get the Spirit of God in you? Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Whoa. God abides in you. That means God lives inside of you and you live inside of God. You confessed in Jesus that he's the Son of God. Man, it's powerful. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Listen, you guys, when you hear that thing about the day of judgment, be confident. Don't be confident because you show love or don't be unconfident because of your lack of showing love. If the spirit of God is in you, you have all the love in you, right? It's just learning to take that and use it and give it out. Some of us have a really hard time with it because mentally we've been blocked, right? Emotionally, we've been blocked for whatever we've gone through in our lives. But don't worry, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. In fact, His perfect love, in verse 18, it says it casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So if your emotion realm is in fear, it's because your emotion realm hasn't been perfected in love. Your spirit's never in fear. Your spirit has been perfected in love. Do you understand? This is all the process of the renewing of our minds, you guys. The reason we love is because he first loved us, verse 19 says. Now check this out. Verse 17 of 1 John 14, or 1 John 4. Verse 17. The end of that verse says, as he is, so also are we in this world. As he is, so also are we in this world. As God is, so also are we in this world. As Christ is, so also are we in this world. What? How? How is that possible? Is God in pain? I'm in pain. If God's not in pain, but I'm in pain, and I'm in this world, and I'm in pain, and it says, as God is, so am I in this world, then then what is that? Does that mean God's in pain or does that mean I don't have God in me? Interesting stuff. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll try to answer these questions as I drive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I went into 1 Corinthians 15 yesterday in a video. There's so much to it, you guys. There's so much to it. I mean, look at, you talk about lots of, lots of notes. I circle the meaning of words. I put a lot of notes in my Bible. I really, really went into depth over 1 Corinthians 15. Yesterday I was talking about becoming immortal. And it's really powerful, you guys. 
But let's see, where do I want to read? I know it's 1 Corinthians 15, but now I have to find the verse that I'm looking for. <laughs> verse 45. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam became a living being. Now, when you see that word being, I don't know what translation you're using, but it's actually the Greek word suke. Suke, it means breath or it means soul. Suke is your soul, actually, a living soul. Watch out where we can find the Hebrew form of the Greek word suke, Genesis chapter 2. Verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man, the man, or in Hebrew, ha adam. Ha is the, adam is man. So when you see over back in Corinthians, go, I'm just going to go back there real quick. The first man, adam, adam, adam means man. I know we call him Adam, like that's his name, but adam translates to man. So it's then God, the Lord God formed the Adam, the Adam, out of the dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils. <sighs> into his nostrils, you guys. He didn't breathe into his mouth. That's what somebody does when they give CPR. They plug the nose and breathe into the mouth, right, of, a, of, of an adult. I think over a baby, you breathe into their nose and their mouth when you do CPR, if it's over a, 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 on a baby. But Adam didn't need CPR. He needed life because God formed him from the dust. The dust. Just the dust. It's like this stuff on my car. Dust. He formed him out of that from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils. Did you know that Adam was actually formed outside of the garden? Because verse eight says, God put him into the garden that was in Eden. The garden was in Eden. The garden was in Eden. I was like, I'm in San Diego. And if God put me in a little spot in San Diego, he called that a garden, Garden in Hebrew is, is gan, gan. It means enclosure, gan. It means an enclosure. So God put Adam, Adam in an enclosure inside of a place called Eden, right? Interesting stuff, right? Because we always call it the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden. But yeah, the Garden of Eden, right? Like if I was in a little enclosure in San Diego, I'm in the enclosure of San Diego. Anyway, so God forms the man out of dust and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, this is a lot of times I've heard from other preachers. They say God ruach, which is spirited. He ruach into the nostrils of Adam, the ruach of life. But this, this Hebrew word is actually not ruach, which is spirit. When it says God breathed, okay, God breathed, it, breathed is nafach, nafach. It's the action. It's to breathe or blow, right? Like a verb. A verb is an action. It's to do this. It's to breathe or blow. It says he breathed, that's the action, into his nostrils, the breath of life. Breath is neshama. So to breathe is nafach. The breath is the noun, the something, right? The breath is ne neshama breath of life. So it's not ruach, it's the breath, neshama of life. And the man became a living nefesh, which is soul. Nefesh. Nefesh means emotion, desire, or passion. So the man became a living emotion, desire, passion. Okay. That's the soul. So nefesh is the Hebrew form of, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Hebrew form of suke, suke. It's where we get the word psyche, psyche, psyche in English, psyche, it's from the soul, soul realm. 
So emotion, passion, desire, right? The first Adam became that. But the last Adam became a life-giving pneuma, which is spirit in Greek. In Hebrew, it would be ruach, ruach. The last Adam became a life-giving ruach. I think I'm gonna stop there and we'll just start driving. So in Christ, now if you're in Christ, you have a soul, but you are not a living soul anymore. You are what, as Jesus, as he is, so are you in this world. You're a life-giving spirit. I'll talk about that while I drive. This is something that one of my viewers made for me some time ago. It's pretty cool because it, this really reminds me of 1 John 4, 17, that as he is, so are you in this world. And you know, <laughs> right when I said that, if you guys watch this video, look at the timing when I said that, as he is, so are you in this world. It said 11, 11 on my video. The timer said that 11 minutes and 11 seconds. Check it out for yourself. If you want to just go back and watch, that, that's awesome. That wasn't planned. <laughs> All right, so somebody made this for me and it has to do with the number 11. This is as he is, so are you in this world. Watch this. Watch this, then I'm gonna get going. This is a picture up here. Let's start with the top. These are two oxen. Oxen. This is an ox and this is an ox. Okay? Side by side. Oxen. Do you know in Hebrew, the number one or the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is Aleph, do you remember? Their letters are also numbers. Their letters have a numerical value. Their letters are also a picture. Their letters are also a sound, Aleph. So the picture of Aleph or the number one is a picture of an ox. Do you see that? It's an ox. Look into the ancient Hebrew and look at a picture of Aleph and you will see the head of an ox or what they call even a bull. So you've got an ox here. Now what a farmer does with oxen is he uses them to plow a field, right? To work the field, to get the soil ready to plant seeds. Huh? Pretty interesting stuff, right? Now watch this. Like you and I, we prepare the soil to plant seeds, right? Get people's hearts prepared to plant the seed, the word of God into them. So here's one ox and here's another ox. Now this ox is the lead ox. This one takes the lead and this one follows. But what causes this one to follow is right here. Do you see that yellow thing right here? That's a yoke. It's what you might call a cross beam. And this red thing right here is the plow. This might be what you call the cross post. Doesn't that look like what Jesus died on? You know, Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary, tired, worn out, take my yoke and I will give you rest. This yoke is what joins you to the Lord in spirit. 1 Corinthians six seventeen, the one you who's joined to the Lord Christ is one spirit. You look like two, these guys look like two, but when you join them together, they become one, like the number 11. The number 11 looks like two numbers, right? But they are an exact reflection of, their, of each other. See that? And these, this number 11, they are not separate number ones, they're number ones that have been, been joined together to make one number. In fact, in Hebrew, the word L that's in the word, English word 11. So you've got a Hebrew word and an English word in the word 11, L even. Hmm? 
These are two words, one in Hebrew, one in English. L in Hebrew is right here. God, that's what it means, God. Even in English means aligned. It's an alignment. So if you take these two words, Hebrew and English, and you join them together as one, they become one word. Eleven, God aligned. Joined together as one with God. God, just like John said. Paul says you become one spirit with the Lord. John says God abides in you, you abide in him. Do you see the oneness, the unity, the joining together? Interesting how God always shows me that number 11, right? And then I saw years ago, in my mind, I saw a picture of two oxen, of two oxes. When you take an ox and an ox and join them together, they become oxen, right? I saw a picture of this in my mind. And this is before I was studying Hebrew, before I understood Hebrew, the letters, the meaning of words or anything. And guess what? For years, I kept get asking God for revelation. Why do I keep seeing this number? Why do I keep seeing this number on a regular basis all the time? And when I saw that vision, and then I start studying Hebrew, I am dumbfounded one day because I see that the Hebrew letter Aleph is also the number one, and the number one is a picture of an ox. And when you take two number ones, you got a picture of two oxes, just like the number 11. Isn't that amazing? Thank you, viewer Stephanie, for making that for me some years ago. I appreciate it, and I like using it as a visual. See, I see 11 all the time. So I talk about it all the time with you guys. And the reason I see it all the time is it's a constant reminder not to live in my emotion realm. Don't let my emotions control me. Have emotions, it's okay to have emotions. It's good to have emotions. Jesus was always moved by compassion, right? His compassion. And that came, his compassion was one with his spirit, right? His soul and his spirit were very in tune to each other. His mind was very in tune to the spirit. Jesus had this, he didn't need any renewing of his mind. He was tuned in. And that's what we're trying to do, you guys. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can be changed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind needs to be tuned in to what God has given you in spirit. Because the spirit you have is God's spirit. There's no separation of your spirit and God's spirit, right? That's why they're joined together as one. That yoke, that crossbeam, cannot separate you, right? You're always joined to God. People separate, right? You know, you know let me, before I keep going on, let me, let me just give you an illustration. Farmers will take their oxen, and what they try to do is they try to find the right match. They take one ox, one ox, and they'll take another ox. They'll join them together under that yoke, that crossbeam, right? And they'll they'll see how these two work together. Does the one ox submit to the other ox, right? Does it submit? The one that follows submits to the one that takes the lead. If the one that it is intended to submit jerks against the other ox and tries to go in a different direction all the time. Well, the farmer doesn't kill that ox that's trying to go in a different direction. What he does is he'll test that ox with another ox until he finds the two that match together and flow in harmony together, right? Just like a husband and a wife should do. They should flow in harmony together. But when the husband's trying to go in one direction, the wife's going another, and they're always button heads, well, that's not, that's not unity, right? You might have a legal marriage technically, but you're not unified. If you're both believers, you're unified in spirit, but you're not unified in your mind or in your soul realm. Do you see how that works? So this is what happens when a farmer takes an ox and another ox, he tests them to see if they work together as one. And if they don't, they're not worthless. They're not good for nothing, you piece of trash, ox. I'm burning you, I'm killing you. No, 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 no. He doesn't waste. He, he 
tries them out with another one, <laughs> right? The, so here's what's awesome about this. Now you might say, but you know, I butt my head with the Lord all the time. I've gone in many different directions with the Lord all the time. I mean, does that mean he's going to unjoin me with himself and try to join himself with somebody else? No. See, the only way that he can be joined to you and be as he is, so are you in this world, one, right now it has to be in spirit. It says, as he is, so are you in this world. But if you're in pain, if your mind's a mess, if all these things are happening, that, that has nothing to do with not being one in spirit. That has to do with a soul and a mind realm, right? That realm, emotions, passions, desires. Which we want to be in harmony with our spirit, but sometimes not. That's why the renewing of the mind, right? That's why we're renewing our minds. See, God cannot be unevenly yoked. He tells us not to be unevenly yoked with what? With unbelievers. Because believing is what yokes you together to the Lord. Just by believing. I'm going to take these off. You don't have to, to be yoked to the Lord. It's not, you don't become yoked by performing for him. You become yoked to the Lord or joined together to the Lord as one by believing. We've already discussed that. You don't do something to become it, you believe. Religion tells you this. Religion says, get baptized. Repent. Try harder, try harder, and maybe you'll be joined to the Lord. Now, if they're correct about that, if this becoming one with the Lord is through your self-efforts, then why did Jesus tell the thief at the cross that was next to him, hey, you're going to be with me in paradise. You're going to be with me in paradise. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, the religious form of repentance, of course, is changing direction. The Holy Spirit says repentance is mind change, metanoia, change your mind. Changing direction is a different word. It's epistrepho in Greek. That's changing direction. Epistrepho is never translated repent. Epistrepho is always turn direction or change direction. Metanoia is translated repent. Metanoia means change your mind. Now, did the thief on the cross have a mind change? Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Oh, wow. He confesses Jesus is Lord. Not only that, he confesses when he says, remember me, he's confessing that Jesus is Savior. Whoa, this truck in front of me is throwing rocks all over my windshield. Did you guys hear that? Wham! <laughs> There's stuff flying out of him. <laughs> I'm surprised my windshield did just now crack. Yeah, I got away from that truck. I slowed down, went into a different lane. Um, the thief says, remember me. He's confessing the Lord as Savior. Not only does he know him as Lord, but now as Savior. Do you see that? He believes. He believed in Jesus. And Jesus says, now you're going to be with me. That's a joining together. Today, you'll be with me in what's going to be called paradise. Do you know that that thief, by the way, do you know I believe this? That he never experienced peace like he did when he was on the cross. The Lord can give you peace at your very darkest hour. The thief is on the cross, but never in his life did he experience peace than when the Lord said, today you're going to be with me. That's peace that surpasses what we call all understanding. You can't comprehend a peace like that. You're on a cross, you got nails in your hands, you're suffering. People are mocking you, ridiculing you looking at you while you're hanging there naked. But the Lord brought this man peace like he never had before. Guarantee you. 
So you can't say that this thief did any changing direction like religion says to do to get saved. Change your direction. The thief didn't jump off and say, okay, Lord, look, at I'm changing my direction. And he didn't even get baptized. There's a, is there a pool of water somewhere, Lord? Can I get off of here and jump in the pool of water, get baptized, get saved? You see that? Baptism is a declaration of what already is. Just like partaking of communion, you are declaring what already is. You're not partaking so that you, when you eat the bread, you will be healed. You don't partake that when, so that when you drink the wine or the grape juice that represents Jesus' blood, you don't partake of that so that you will be saved, so that you will be forgiven. When you partake of the bread, you're declaring what he has already done. By his stripes, I was healed. By his broken body, I am repaired. I've been repaired. Whether my body is, is, is going into alignment with what is in the spirit, that doesn't matter right now. I'm declaring the truth with my mouth and I'm partaking of these, these elements or emblems because that is the truth. I'm declaring what's already been done. And so the same is this. When you get baptized, you're declaring already what has already been done. I have been crucified with Christ. I have died to my old self. I have been buried with him and I am risen in him, righteous and innocent, not guilty. He was raised on account of your justification, Romans 4.25. You're just declaring what's already been done when you get baptized. Getting dunked in water is not going to save you. Because that's a work, right? So please don't get that stuff confused. So the thief didn't have time for that, right? But he got saved, didn't he? So you and I, become one spirit with the Lord because we believe. Like Adam and Eve, do you know when Adam partook of the fruit from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I believe what happened to Adam is, because if you read the Hebrew, God says the day that you eat of that tree, um, you will positively die. That's how your Bible read says it in English. But in Hebrew, it says dying, you shall die. Dying, you shall die. This means the process of dying has begun. Your body is responding to what happened in the spirit. In the spirit, I believe what happened was Adam's light got shut off. And when that light turned off, it took his body 900 some years to respond and die, right? Didn't he die at the age of 900 something? If I'm wrong about that, sorry, but I know it's way up there. So it took him a while to die till his body died. But the truth is that day dying, he began to die. You see the process. Now, the day that you believe that your light has been turned on. You become aware that your light has been turned on. What, Jesus? He turned my light on? You weren't aware of it? But when you believed it, that caused you to be aware of it? Believing. Believing is what saved you. It rescued you from believing that you were darkness, right? Now you truly are light. Some people don't believe their darkness, they believe their light, but they're in a false light, just like the, the devil comes as an angel of light. This is a pseudo light, a false light. It's not true light. Just like there's another form of love. It's a false love. It's an emotional love. It's the kind that the world teaches. I love, I love, I love. But God is love. And if you don't believe in God, then you truly don't believe in true love because God is true love. So a world sense of love might be just based on emotions and physical stuff. But true love is of spirit. Do you understand that? Because God is love and God is spirit. Now Jesus... <laughs> Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Now, don't think that he is only spirit and doesn't have his body. Just like Adam became a living soul, well, he still had his body, didn't he? Just wasn't a soul walking around. He was a, a he had a body still. 
Jesus was raised from the dead. Resurrection is bodily. Resurrection isn't spirit. He didn't breathe out his spirit and his spirit fell to the ground dead and then it came back to life later. No, his spirit was always alive. It's when his spirit entered back into his body, that's called resurrection. And Jesus came in a new body, not a body of flesh and blood, but a body of flesh and blood, bone. Something was causing him to still live without the life that's in the blood anymore. The life is in the blood, well not in Jesus. The life is in the spirit. I believe that when you and I are transformed and changed in that twinkling of an eye in a, in a flash, in a moment, in an atomic second, look up the Greek. It's interesting. Atomic. We're changed and we are made just like him. We have a spiritually glorified body now. That's what we're hoping for. See, that's when all of us spirit soul body all will be one with the lord that way when you say as he is so am i in this world guess what it'll be as he is spirit as he is soul as he is body so am i in this world but right now in this world because we haven't been changed and transformed yet as he is so are we it's in spirit you guys which is a beautiful foundation because like i was saying earlier god cannot become unevenly yoked so since he can't yoke himself evenly right now with your flesh he can't yoke himself evenly with your mind because there's a renewing of the mind that's going on so that's not even so where did he yoke himself doesn't say the one that's joined the Lord is one soul doesn't say the one that's joined the Lord is is one flesh with him the one that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him so God evenly yoked himself to your spirit. <sighs> That's why I believe that when, when we partake of that marriage ceremony with Jesus, that's when we put on what, I, what is called in Greek oikaterion. That's where we become one body, one soul, as we are already one spirit with him. That way, when he officially marries you, you're married in spirit, but I'm talking about when the whole wedding celebration of the bride and the groom, that's where you're transformed, every part of you. And now he can equally yoke himself to every bit of you, spirit, soul, body, joined as one, just like him, as he is, so are you in every way. But right now we're joined to him in spirit and what God has joined together. No one can separate that you guys. No one can. That's why I see that number 11 all the time. It's a reminder of who I am and who you are in Christ. I'm going to keep on preaching this 11 stuff because it's so powerful and we do need constant reminders of it. Don't we? Let me just think if I'm forgetting to say anything before I go covered the soul Adam became a life giving uh, 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 Adam became a living soul Jesus is a life giving spirit yeah Jesus does have a body he's talking about that so he's a life giving spirit you have a body but you are a life giving spirit that is why when you speak to the mountains they move right that mountain must not be life, right? It must be death. So when you speak to it, move out of the way. You're casting out death. Do you understand? When you are laying hands on the sick, Mark 16, Jesus says that. You'll lay hands on the sick, they'll be well. So when you're laying hands on the sick, that life that you're giving to them, so sickness has to flee, do you know that life doesn't come from your hand? Your hand is just an instrument to deliver what is in you, that spirit. So you are a life-giving spirit. Do you understand that? You have your soul, you have your body, but you are a life-giving spirit, just like Jesus. He was made a life-giving spirit, that second Adam, right? Second Adam. First Adam became a living soul. Last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first will become last, and the last will become first. So now... You're not a living soul. 
You're a life-giving spirit. The last second atom became first. Boom. And the first atom became last. The soul. So now you carry your soul. Right? Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. I think that's where I, where I wanted to finish, you guys. Just remember, you're always one with the Lord. You're joined to the Lord in spirit. Now we're getting that soul realm and we're, that mind realm and getting our body to cooperate. You understand that? <laughs> I hope so. I hope this message has blessed you. I love you guys. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day.